Welcome to the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. Greg, I, I was hearing Celine Dion in the back of my head. It's all coming back to me now after they scored 30 points for the first time in over a thousand days. It was ugly, but they got it done, Tennessee did, against the Miami <laughs> Dolphins. It I was, wasn't expecting a Celine Dion reference uh, from you, Buck, but that's okay. You don't like Celine? Come on, Greg. You're a, you're a music guy. I am, and you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but years and years and years ago, um, I was in Las Vegas with my family. I think my youngest daughter, who's now 28, was probably five. I don't know. And we and we saw Celine Dion, but that goes back many, many years ago. Well, that's that's how long it's been. Many, many years ago since this yeah. Titans team was able yeah. to play yeah. 30 <laughs> points. But anyway, it's we, there's not a lot to say about this game. You and I kind of briefly went over it before we went to air here. But um a tough night, a tough night for the Dolphins. Dolphins got a lot of things to figure out without Tua. That that goes unsaid. Uh, Titans defense and running game are the story here beyond yeah. the quarterback situation, which we'll talk about. Yeah, and mainly, I Greg, I wanted to focus with you on Tavondre Sweat because on a night without Jeffrey Simmons, and I know they went against Aaron Brewer, who's you know undersized, especially for a guy like Sweat. Sweat played his ass off. It was wild to watch. You know. He, we've talked about him even going back to the draft, and and obviously uh, we had Rand Carthon on when we did our install live, uh, you know, at um, uh, at the hotel. I mean, which was unbelievable at the Hutton Hotel back in. I guess that was the first week in May. God, it doesn't That's seem right. that long ago because it was. So we'll be fun. doing it before long. Don't don't. I you know. Worry. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> but you know, we talked about Sweat then, and I, I I talked about how athletic he was, how light on his feet he was for someone that big. And I got to tell you, uh, what really stands out when you watch Sweat, to me anyway, among many things, is his lateral mobility. I mean, he makes plays in the run game down the line of scrimmage, outside the box. He has light feet. He has really easy movement for a man that size. Um, he keeps moving off contact. You know, in this league, when you're a defensive lineman, you have to be able to play off contact and keep moving. Um, and he, he's able, almost like a running back, he's able to stop and start change direction with balance, body control. Um, he's got confined space strength to play off contact. I mean, so far, he's been a really, really good player through four games. Um, and the thing, too, is that he played 47 snaps this week because yeah. um, obviously Simmons was out. So Joseph Day played 49. They played Anderson, small school kid from Bucknell. He played 24 snaps. He showed up at times on film. Um, so, but sweat has really, really played well. And, uh, you know, you'd have to assume barring anything unforeseen, you know, let's hope there's no other issues of any kind, but right now he looks like a really good draft pick and a really good, good player. Well, and that, that's the thing, Greg, I mean, real feel, and I know the, the sun went down around kickoff, but it was, it was, it felt about 102 on the field in Miami. And for a guy that size, we've talked about the conditioning. He, we talked to him in the locker room afterwards. He said he didn't miss a beat. And he, like I said, he played 47 snaps, which I think was close to 80% of the snaps, if, if uh, memory serves me correctly. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was that was a really impressive performance. Um, now, granted, it, you know, look, at the end of the day, it's hard to win in the NFL. Um, you know, not being sarcastic, but we know that the Titans have had trouble winning over, all, you know, a, a meaningful number of games. So all you're trying to do is win, you know, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, to make a baseball analogy, it's like, you know, a blue pit in the box score is still a hit, you know, yeah. they won a football game. That's what matters. Uh, was, was the opponent the best offensively? Of course not. We know that, but you know what? They won the game. Now they have something to, to at least going into the bye week something ideally to build upon. We can certainly talk about the offense in a moment here, but you know, the idea is to win the game. So now everybody feels a little better uh, going into the bye week and that, you know, hey, there's we don't have to have, you know, the come to Jesus meetings where we're terrible. Now, now we want a football game. Yeah, those are being had currently in Jacksonville, which is an unholy mess oh. in time. We, we, we may touch on that here at some point, Greg, because that I I mean, we, we've talked about the Lawrence thing before, but uh, we'll save that for maybe later in the podcast. 
like to your point about the offense, the offense is a question mark, and we're going to see whether or not they have something to build upon. Sounds like Levis is going to get through the bye week, two week six. Okay, he's dealing with a shoulder injury right now. Uh, Brian Callahan wouldn't tell us if it was his throwing shoulder, so that right now is. Well, a it no looked like it based on the you know the way he landed. Yeah, I don't didn't want to didn't want to necessarily yeah because I wasn't seeing the TV. I haven't seen the TV copy yet. Just from uh, right. just from doing it in the well, press. That's box. the way it looked. I mean, because I saw it live on TV. And um, obviously saw the tape, but I mean, um, that's what it looked like. I right. mean, again, I'm not a doctor, you know, we, we don't know all the details, but it didn't, it didn't look serious. I mean, when I say serious, like, you know, he's going to be out for a long stretch. Right. Uh, the thing that is serious, though, is the turnover issue. And he threw another interception uh, before he was ultimately out of the game halfway through the first quarter to Emmanuel Ogba. I wonder if you could talk about that play a little bit, because sure, last yeah, week yeah. you mentioned predetermined throws, and from my vantage point, Greg, um, that looked like one. Well, let me explain it. it, it and again, I don't know what's in Levis's head, other than on the TV, they did show a close-up where it appeared he was saying to whoever he said it to that I didn't see him. Now, right. again, so I don't know what was in his head, but what the play was was a basic concept. It was snag flat, meaning there's a flat route, and then kind of a short curl route, which we call a snag route. Like, you know, it's a very basic concept. It's called to get a quarterback comfortable. It's almost automatic, an automatic type completion, okay? So the, the flat route, he saw the corner expand. So he said, okay, the flat route's gone. And then Hopkins was running the snag. But by the way, he slipped, which you probably saw. Yeah. He slipped. So what happened, which he clearly did not expect, Levis that is, was that the DN dropped out. So he was not expecting that at all. So it's not a matter, I, I didn't view that as a predetermined throw in the sense that I, I think we've spoken about before. Okay. I, I think he just thought, okay, it's snagged flat. The, 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 the That defender expanded, the snag's going to be wide open. He, there's no way he thought the defensive end was dropping out. So I don't think that was predetermined as much as he was surprised. Yeah. Now that I'm not defending him, yeah, sure. I don't want to think I'm defending him, but you know, I think that was a surprise to him. And personally, I could be dead wrong. Only Hopkins can answer this. I think if he didn't slip, Hopkins would have taken a step further inside, and so that the, the Agbo would not have been in the passing lane. Yeah, and, but that's and, just my opinion. I could be wrong. No, and and that's you know we reiterate it all the time, but it's it's fair to say again this is not this is not a, a take by Greg right this is what the tape is showing on on right. the, not a defensive Levis but an explanation and this is why right. the turnover discussions are so uh, so important to have Greg because they all do deserve context and he is an inexperienced quarterback but the thing that continues to be at the crux of his issues are turnovers yeah and and you know I think that. Every, here's the way I've always felt about turnovers. You have to look at each play as an individual play. Obviously, anybody can look at a stat sheet and say that's too many. And yes, that's an inarguable point. Uh, you know, well, you know, it's like a quarterback. If he throws 20 interceptions, that's too many. But you still have to look at each one individually and see why they occur because you're coaching the guy based on those kinds of plays. You know, so, and you're trying to... to, to call concepts that define it for him like for instance two or three plays before the interception they had a beautifully designed route concept where he hit hopkins for 16 yards mm -hmm. you probably remember the play it was really a beautifully designed play that really defined the read and the throw for levis you've got to do that as much as possible now granted you're going to get into pure pass situations in every game um then it's harder to truly define it because the defense very often has a tactical advantage when you get into those, let's say, third and longs. Um, and then then obviously the quarterback does have to read progressions, does have to understand a defense, does, has to have an intuitive feel for things. Um, when it's first and 10 or when it's a more normal down and distance and you can be more proactive with your play calls because you're more likely to get more predictable fronts and more predictable coverages, you know, that's that's where you hope your quarterback really executes at a high level. But I think you're dealing with a quarterback in Levis who's a very aggressive thrower, okay? I think he's also one of those guys, because his arm strength is high level, that believes he can make throws that sometimes are not there. What you have to hope, and I'm not defending him, and, and hey, look, he may be good, he may not be. We don't know the answer to that. But you hope that with experience, 
he gets a better feel for the throws he can make and can't make, especially in given game situations. Obviously, if you're down 27-14 in the fourth quarter, you've got to attempt some some high higher risk throws. Right. But you don't want to attempt those throws in the first quarter of a 0-0 game. You yeah. know, and the one thing that I'm a strong believer in, and you know, I'm gonna study this a little more, is and I've talked to a lot of offensive coaches in my time, as you know, Buck, is with with young quarterbacks in particular, but but it should be the case all the time, is there should always be an outlet throw. Okay. There should always be a throw that can be made. You know, you don't never want to put the quarterback in a position where there's no outlet throw, particularly a young, inexperienced quarterback. So that I have to look at more, but that should be part and parcel of any route combination that is called. Uh, definitely worth looking into in a in a future episode for sure. Uh, so just just to kind of put a bow on on this por- this portion of the conversation, Greg. Um, as it's not a majority, but there are Titans fans who are interested in seeing Mason Rudolph start games for this team. I would like you to dispel that notion. No, if you will. no because he, here's the issue. We know what Mason Rudolph is in the NFL. Um, and by the way, I've met him. <laughs> he's a, he's the nicest guy. In the, I mean, this is not personal. Sure. You know, We know what he is. He's not an NFL starting quarterback. We don't know what Levis is yet. What we do know is that Levis has NFL starter traits at a reasonably high level. Stylistically, he is at times reckless and undisciplined. We need to work through that. You know, that's just the way it is in the NFL. I mean, you have to let this guy work through it. This team's not competing for a Super Bowl this year. You've got to let Levis work through it, see where he is after he plays at least, and I would suggest even more, but at least a full season worth of games. But I I would suggest that unless he totally implodes, and by the way, he hasn't imploded. He's had some bad turnovers that have to be cleaned up. But unless he were to totally implode and you feel like as a coaching staff that you literally can't call plays for him, um, he's got to play every snap. You've got to let this kid work through it. From everything that I've heard from people that coached him, see, I've talked to people who've coached him, they say that he's an incredibly hard worker, that he's super intelligent, that he wants it so badly, almost too badly, they say sometimes. You know, you've gotten a chance to talk to him, I'm sure, and you've probably heard the same thing. Yeah, um, that tracks. Yeah, but you've got to let him work through this. Um, you know, he's – Mason Rudolph is is in a perfect spot as a backup. That's what he is. And he's a quality backup. You can put him in. He's not going to ruin your game. Just like the other night, he didn't ruin your game. Um, but you, you didn't have to ask him to do very much, given the way the game played out. So And and he said as much in the post game with us afterwards in, in Miami. And that, you know, Greg, I don't know if you caught this this uh, interview that was making the rounds last week of, uh, of Kevin O'Connell, the Vikings coach. I think he was with Rich Eisen talking about, you know, how – organizations are failing young quarterbacks before young quarterbacks fail organizations. Yes. And I, and I, I know Kevin, about that before. and I know Kevin very well. In fact, I had a great talk with him this summer about JJ McCarthy, be, you know, be, who he drafted. And obviously he unfortunately got hurt. So I, I know how Kevin feels about all of that. And I believe him to be true. I believe what he said is absolutely right. You know, see to me, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not in the building of all these organizations, but I've had many conversations over the years. And obviously I've studied this for a very, very long time and been very fortunate to taught, be taught the quarterback position by people smarter than I am. But, you know, I think that you have to teach a quarterback how to play NFL quarterback. I think that very often the media has it wrong. Like I'll give you a perfect example. After two weeks we started to hear that, oh, Caleb Williams isn't going to be any good with this. Co- this coaching staff's no good for Caleb Williams. That's it's backwards. Caleb Williams has to be taught how to play NFL quarterback. Just because he's got a lot of traits and a lot of talent doesn't mean he knows how to play NFL quarterback. So he has to be taught that. Will Levis has to be taught and constantly coached how to play NFL quarterback. So it's not, oh, well, if a guy comes in just because he's really talented and had a great college career, that if he's not great right away, that means the coaching staff is bad. You know, we don't see the the Strouds and maybe the Daniels every year. That doesn't happen every single year. Um, And we certainly don't know what's going on in Washington and how he's being coached. Um, 
but obviously it's working through four games. Um, but the point is, is it's backwards. These guys have to be coached how to play in the NFL, not, well, you know, do what these guys do. And if the coach doesn't do that, the coach is bad. Well, you know, I could go on and on about this, you know, about what I see on, on tape, but it's, it's just the total wrong approach when people talk about quarterbacks and Kevin O'Connell has it a hundred percent right. No. And, and that's why I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have you expand on it because I know that I, we have talked about geography and, and players at the top of the draft landing with bad teams and things like that before. Look, and uh, let, let's just a lot finish this conversation. And you mentioned this earlier, another guy who's an unbelievably great kid because I've been around him is Trevor Lawrence. Okay. <laughs> Trevor came out and obviously, and I'm not be, trying to be sarcastic at all, but he was considered generational, you know, maybe the greatest quarterback we had seen coming out in who knows how long. Okay. Not his fault that he was branded that that's not his fault, you know? Um, but you know what? It hasn't quite worked. I mean, he's not a bad player. I mean, I know that he hasn't won a game in his last nine or 10 starts, but you know, I don't view quarterback wins as, I mean, team wins is purely a quarterback stat, so I'm not. I don't put that solely on him. Levis got a win for Monday night, so for right, quarter, right, right, wins right. Awards, yeah. exactly. So you know, and and you and I have discussed Lawrence, and I told you that over the summer I went through 250 or so dropbacks over the course of two days, so I was able to really evaluate and 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 you know interpret what I saw, and I thought there were some things that he had to continue to work through. So you know, he's in his fourth year. We're not in the building. We don't know how it's, you know, how he's coached, what's going on, but it's not as if he's a bad player or doesn't have traits. You know, it sometimes it, it, it's different for every quarterback and you can't talk about these guys like they're above the game or above being coached. You can't do that. I mean, I was, I was very fortunate in my career to be able to be at 49ers training camps when Bill Walsh coached the quarterbacks and every detail, I mean, I'm talking about every detail was coached and drilled to the point where I'm sure Joe Montana probably thought it was nauseating. Mm -hmm. But that's, but hey, Joe Montana became a Hall of Famer as a third round pick. So, and, you know, and one of the two or three best of all time. Um, so, you know, that's the way it needs to be done. And that's the way players, they need to accept that coaching and understand that this is a different deal than playing in the Pac-12 or even the SEC. It's a different deal. Yeah. And and I, I love that you brought up Jaden Daniels because that almost skews that perception even further, right? And it's it's a great job by him, and it's a great job by Cliff Kingsbury so far this year, Greg. I, I don't know how many uh, breakdowns you've done of their offense. I have, and there's a ton of, of easy throws, which is the yeah. right – by the way, that's no knock on Jaden Daniels. That's the right thing to do. Right. You know, give him one read or no read throws – let him get comfortable. Obviously, the completion percentage the last two weeks in particular has been off the charts. Um, he's made a few really difficult throws, no question. But the larger majority of his throws are are basically kind of routine, easy throws that most quarterbacks could make. So now what's happened? He's played four games. He's feeling really comfortable. Now you can start expanding. You know, but what's going to happen too is, and this happens with all quarterbacks, is teams start to get a feel. Look, C.J. Stroud, I think, is really, really good, but there have been this year. It's not been quite as smooth as it was a year ago because teams get a book on him on the offense, and then you have to make some adjustments. The great ones do, and I think C.J. Stroud will, by the way. Um, but that's what happens in the league. Yeah, and their schedule is absolutely brutal this year, which leads us to our uh, next portion of the discussion. The NFL Matchup Show, of course, gets you ready for every week of NFL football on ESPN. You can catch it on demand on ESPN Plus at your DVRs as well, and you can watch it as you please. Uh, Bills and Texans in That's Houston an, this week is a huge our show. game. See, here's an amazing thing to me, you know, just to throw a stat out, that Nico Collins has more than 100 receiving yards than the second most – a player in the league that's remarkable yeah you know he's he's a i to me because i did him over the summer too i watched all of his targets from last year he's six four and an eight 215 which is a trait by the way he's to me now in the discussion of the top five receivers in the league i mean this guy and and he catches a lot of balls between the numbers between the hashes he works the middle of the field exceptionally well He's a fluid athlete. I mean, he doesn't have four, three, five speed, but he is not a plotter by any means. He can move. Um, 
he's a really difficult guy. I mean, that's going to be an interesting matchup because the Bills play a really high percentage of too high safety structure. And ideally, that helps take that away. But we'll see how it plays out. That's that's an interesting game. But, you know, what, what happened with the Bills just shows you how much of a week-to-week league it is. It doesn't mean the Bills are a bad team. You know, it's, it, it's a week-to-week league. No, truly. I, that 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 is a Sunday nighter with Derrick Henry doing vintage oh. Derrick Henry things. It, it had a lot of Titans fans in their fields come the radio show Monday night. I, I was just going to ask you that, particularly uh, that 87-yard run on the first play from scrimmage probably you know brought back memories, good and bad, for Titans fans. Yeah, well, it just it had been a while, honestly, Greg, since I'd seen him pull away from a secondary like that. I, no know. question, no question. And, and, he and, and he, he's he's hit 20 miles an hour. Uh, the second most in the league, and the first is Tyreek Hill. Like, it's crazy that somebody at that size and at his age is still doing it this way. I know. And and I tell you what, he is in the perfect offense because I watched that tape. That is a really difficult offense to defend. Um, the Lamar factor is – because he's the only guy who can really do that. I mean, I think other teams might think, oh, my guy can do that. He's the only guy who can do what he does as far as running and as far as the run game – being him being such a major part of it and how you have to defend it there's so much misdirection there's so much backfield action and there's Lamar so it's a really difficult offense to defend I mean the last two weeks um he's thrown 15 balls and 18 balls yeah you know because you know they the run game has been so good yeah it's it's probably exactly what Todd Munkin's looking for to be able to have that change up and very uh very yeah. week to week with that rushing they may run for 500 yards against the Bengals this weekend Greg Bengals defense having a tougher time I know they got right this weekend but still it's it's been uh tough sledding in the early yeah early no I mean they're, they're 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 struggling to defend the run so we'll see yeah uh what uh what piece in particular would you like the audience to uh key in on on the matchup uh what am i doing this week let's see um i'm I'm taking a look at nico collins just because uh, you know you almost have to um and then um cowboys steelers i'm looking at the steelers defense with with the the focus is really tj watt but it's not just oh look at tj watt he's good watch him sack the quarterback it's more about his impact and how offenses have to respond to his impact and how the Steelers knowing how offenses often have to respond, then do other things that's that, then allow him to be one-on-one. So it's, it's very tactical in, in that way. Um, and I always love looking because quite frankly, the chiefs don't give you a lot of offense these days. Mm. I love looking at Steve Spagnuolo's pressure concepts. Um, I did a piece a couple of weeks ago, which I really felt good about. I'm doing another one this week, obviously a different play, but I think he's as good as there is in the league in using his defensive backs as part of, of pressure. And uh, and he's so situational with it. It just, but he's so good at it. It's as if he just knows. Hey, now is the exact right time to call this. He just seems to know. Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely an innate sense. It's what makes him one of the best of all time. Just quickly on the way out the door, Greg, you, you bring up the Chiefs' offense, and they're four and zero, right? Like it's they they've had worse starts certainly, right. but. I, our, our teams, they, they adapt because, as you mentioned earlier, the great ones f- figure out ways to adapt. And Andy Reid and Mahomes as a combo are certainly great. But how are you t- seeing teams slow them down specifically this season? Well, I'll say this. I feel like watching Mahomes, that this is what happened two or three years ago. He went through a stretch where he started to leave the pocket too early where he didn't play with any sense of timing and rhythm and everything became a second reaction play. And while he can make some of them, you know, they don't always happen. We, because we, he's done it so often in his career, we assume that it's always going to happen. Um, so right now he's kind of in that bit of a funk. He's not really playing with any timing and rhythm. Um, he's, he's not letting plays develop. I know people are just going to say, um, well, he doesn't have great receivers. And he doesn't right now. And obviously Rice being out, we'll see what happens if they decide to trade for anybody or, or you know, dance with the girl who brung you, as it were. Um, but, you know, I think that he he has to play at a higher level. Um, and and we know he's certainly capable of it. Look, he's won the last two Super Bowls. He's a great player. That's, that's not the point. But I'm just telling you what the tape shows. And the tape shows that right now he's – not he doesn't look really comfortable now maybe he's not comfortable because he doesn't feel comfortable with his receivers we're not in his head buck but what the tape shows is that he's not dropping back 
with a sense of let me plant my back foot. Let me see what I have. Let me play with some rhythm, some timing. Let me get the ball out. That's not the way he's playing right now. Well, uh, it has uh, certainly been interesting through the first month of the season. we got a couple of months to go to see who kind of differs or pulls away from uh, from their respective divisions and things like that. Greg, I appreciate your time as always. Now I'm off to the beach, and I hope you have a great weekend, bub. You too, Buck. Enjoy yourself, man. <laughs> Thanks, buddy.